Has Pep Guardiola made football boring? Well, that's the big question lots of people have been asking this week. So today I'm joined by Jonathan McKenzie and Duncan Alexander to ask just that. Well, John, I watched Arsenal Manchester City and I have to say, I was bored. But I thought it was the kind of game that you actually might have really enjoyed because you're a massive loser. <laughs> uh, I think we, what we should do here is we should distinguish between entertainment and, uh, and, and boredom. Because yeah. I think that boring suggests that there's nothing interesting about a, a topic. Actually, what you mean by that is there wasn't enough to entertain you, right? And you're speaking to someone who spent over 10 years studying the intricacies of medieval philosophy. <laughs> So, um, which I, I, even I would admit is a little bit boring, but I would, sure. I would say that there are things of interest in there. Obviously, interesting, is, not entertaining. Yeah, exactly. Maybe I think it's important uh, for us, to, Duncan, to define what we mean by boring, or at least what it is that you think fans mean by boring when they talk about a game like Arsenal, Man City. Yeah, I mean, I think there's kind of a folk memory of fear of nil-nil draws, which has been around for a long time. I think the 2003 Champions League final wasn't helpful on that front. Um, you know, it was split down the middle. Some people thought it was a tactically interesting game between Juventus and AC Milan. Others thought it, yeah, was pretty boring. I think in the context of this season, that game last weekend, I thought was, like John said, it was, the intensity was made it entertaining. I think the fact there weren't any goals in a, a game, so many, so many people were invested in kind of, you know, this is the title decider. Well, mm. it was never going to be the title decider because there's loads more games coming up. Um, and, and we're in the, another team in first. Exactly, yeah. So I think it kind of kept the title race going. So in, in that sense, it was a very entertaining match in the sense of the, the whole season. But yeah, I mean, if people wanted goals, of which they've seen many this season, then it didn't provide on that front. Mm. And from like a perspective of, of picking different metrics, it is, is goals per game the main one that you think you would use if you were trying to define what people mean by boring? Yeah, I think because it's such an easy metric to grasp, and I think it does kind of track quite well with what people kind of have seen as duller times in football. You know, if we go back to the 2000s and look at the Mourinho and Benitez high priest era of defence, then, you know, there weren't many goals. And I think that it's when it kind of affects all the matches in a season, pretty yeah. much. Whereas I think this season, that game was such an outlier that I think it's actually, for me, it made it more entertaining because it wasn't, oh, look, another 4-3. So. Yeah. You could even argue the other way around that because there's an expectation of goals when the best, the team between two of the best teams in the league is played out and there are no goals, everyone feels a little bit shortchanged. And that was the impression that I, I kind of got from, from what people were saying on social media was, you know, look at all of the riches of players that both of these teams have and neither of them seemed particularly bothered about trying to get the ball in the net. It's worth saying as well, I mean, we, we intro the video by asking if, if football is boring now. I think what we actually mean in the context of this week and the conversation is, are those big title decider contests, Arsenal, Man City, are those games boring? Are there tactical reasons why they are? And it's clear that we're going to talk about Guardiola a lot for the rest of this episode. So we thought we'd queue up beforehand Alex Barker on a timeline of boring for Guardiola. He's going to go back through history and tell us uh, if Guardiola has or hasn't become more boring. So, many people have accused Guardiola's approach to big games as being boring. But has that always been the case? Well, to answer that, we need to understand what pivotal moments have shaped Guardiola's approach in the first place. And I think the best starting point is April 2011, the Copa del Rey final between Guardiola's Barcelona and Jose Mourinho's Real Madrid. Up until this point, Barcelona had been an incredibly successful side, especially against Madrid. Yet on this occasion, Mourinho had a plan that would halt this dominance. Madrid sat off in a mid-block, inviting Barcelona to come forward, uh, most notably their fullbacks. They also started Pepe and Kadira in midfield, hassling anyone in these central spaces, meaning Barca were more prone to losing the ball in midfield and there was space that Madrid could exploit. That's exactly how they scored the only goal of the night. In the 13th minute of extra time, Messi lost the ball just around the centre circle. Real Madrid then moved the ball wide to where there was a retreating Dani Alves. They beat him in a 1-2, crossed it in and Cristiano Ronaldo was there to score the winner. They had shown that Barcelona's usual tactical approach wasn't invulnerable, and this encouraged Guardiola to adjust his tactics for future encounters. He stopped his fullbacks from pushing too far forward, preferring them to stay back, wary of the counter-attacking threat. He'd even go on to play Carlos Puyol at left-back on multiple occasions. Barcelona scored fewer goals, but they lost just once more against Madrid during the remainder of Guardiola's time there. But this wasn't the last time a defeat against Los Blancos would influence Guardiola's tactical approach. Because three years later, his Bayern Munich team would beat 
4-0 by Carlo Ancelotti's side in the Champions League semi-final, a result many consider to be the worst of Guardiola's career. And thanks to Marty Palanau's book Pep Confidential, we have a good idea of what went wrong. After losing the first leg 1-0, Guardiola knew the risk that Madrid could just sit deep in the second leg and hit Bayern on the counter. Mindful of this, he planned to play a 3-4-3 so he could protect against the counter-attacking threat and control the midfield more by loading it with more bodies. But he later changed his mind and Bayern instead lined up in their usual 4-2-3-1. They had dominated the Bundesliga with this setup and the thinking was that they could press high and overwhelm Real Madrid. However, as Guardiola later admitted, this was the biggest mistake of his career. Bayern were hit with a wave of counter-attacks and went 3-0 down inside 33 minutes. Post-match, Guardiola reflected that his side had needed more control. It's quite telling in their next game against a big side, against Dortmund in the DFB Pokal final, Bayern went with a back three. And Guardiola did the same again when they faced Barcelona the following season. He was now willing to make larger, safer changes to his tactical approach against elite teams. If it meant he could gain more control and limit the threat of conceding goals in transition. And that thought process seemed to suit him well over the next few years. He moved to Manchester City, and by the midpoint of the 2017-18 season, Guardiola had built a side that looked like one of the favourites for the Champions League and that was unbeaten in the Premier League. Unfortunately for him, Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool were about to change all of that. That January, they ended City's chance of an invincible season. Four months later, the Reds ended their Champions League hopes too. Liverpool scored nine goals in three games in a season where City only conceded 23 in 38 league matches. So, why did they struggle so much against Klopp? Well, seven of those nine goals came from City losing the ball, either through a misplaced pass or through the Liverpool press, prompting a counter-attack that led to the goal. Even though Guardiola had tried to make changes in each of these three games, including moving to a back three in their final match, City still couldn't contain Liverpool during counter-attacks. Now, Guardiola's response to this wasn't as obvious as previous defeats, but over time, we can see the direction he shifted towards after these Liverpool matches. Their pass accuracy against the traditional big six sides gradually increased over the next seven seasons, barring a dip in the 21-22 campaign. We could also see the average number of dispossessions per game decreased, following a similar pattern. And if we revisit his lineup in the 0-0 draw versus Arsenal, we can see this data play out in his selections. Guardiola started four centre-backs, helping City to win more duels, and benched the player who loses the ball more often than anyone else in the City squad, Jeremy Doku, showing his desire to limit the number of transitions that City faced, as well as making sure they were equipped to deal with any counter-attacks that did arise. Okay, John, that's Alex's assessment, but can you tell me specifically what it is about Guardiola's football now that people think is boring? Yeah, and to understand Guardiola's football, we need to understand the concept of positional play. Mm -hmm. So the idea of positional play in its, its simplest form is that when you're playing football, you want to work the ball through lines of pressure, right? So let's, this is Man City in, in the light blue here. And what we've got is the red team, we've got you know, roughly three, three lines of pressure. And what you need to do to try and get into dangerous goal scoring situations is work your way through these, these lines of pressure. Every team is trying to do that. Um, there's different ways that you can do that. So let's imagine that this centre back has the ball. Uh, there's one way they can get through this line of pressure and that's just by ball carrying, right? So that he could just come up to this player, dribble them, get, get around them, you're through that first line of pressure. Which is you know, a perfectly acceptable way of playing, but the problem is at, is at the highest level, your, your centre-back is probably unlikely to be able to just easily beat the, the first man in the opposition press mm -hmm. every time. Uh, so it becomes a bit of high risk, right? Uh, yeah. Especially because if you lose the ball here, they're going to score. So the other and, option unless is... Unless your centre-back is Saliba or Ben White. Sure, but even still, like you will, you will very, very rarely in the elite game, even see you, you'll see them ball carrying, you'll very rarely see them take on sure. uh, an, an opposing pressing player. The other option, of course, is you can, you can pass the ball. Uh, through the line of pressure. The problem with that is, of course, that you'll, you'll have the opposition player standing in between those two players to, to make that harder. And actually the beauty of this kind of uh, approach is that you can you, you get what we call cover shadows, right? So, uh, let's see, I never get to use this. Oh, you can use the exciting feature. The cover shadow yeah. feature. I like to think of it as the laser gun feature, but yeah. you know, each to their own. <laughs> the thing here is, is that actually with one player you can defend two players, right? Because if this centre back has the ball, the, the pressing player can move up here to the ball carrier mm -hmm. uh, and in their cover shadow the other player is so you're you're basically stopping both players from having the ball yeah uh, and so what you can do if, if a team are just trying to pass through the lines is make sure that your, your team are constantly um, uh, covering those passing lanes this brings us to the, the sort of basic principle of positional play because what positional play wants to do is really pull apart this this ability for one player to defend two players by actually having another player coming in 
mm. and, uh, and, and taking that player out of the equation entirely through a, what we might call a third man com combination or a layoff. So the idea then is if this player passes the ball forward, the centre back can pass the ball to the middle player who can then play it around the, the on rushing pressing player. And what you've done then is you've, you've developed what, what you might call a positional advantage. You've used, you've used the positions of your players to actually move the ball through a line of pres pressure. You've created a free man in between the lines. Uh, and if you can do this, with, with any sort of regularity, what that means is that you're going to comfortably be able to move the ball down the field. Mm -hmm. The fundamental principle of positional play is what we're trying to do is use the positions of our players to be able to develop these positional advantages to help us move the ball through lines of pressure yeah. uh, and, and generate eventually dangerous chances. Man City are very good at that and that's why they're one of the best teams in the world. This sounds very exciting. What's boring about this? So the issue is, is that there's a very easy fix for this, right? Which right. is, if you're, what you're trying to do is uh, create these positional advantages, free men between the lines, the opposition can stop that quite easily by making sure there's never free men between the lines. So why you'll often see uh, Man City games become quite boring is because the opposition will eventually compress and make it so that there's not really easy free men between the lines. Mm -hmm. So they might drop into this kind of structure here. Uh, now we've got the, the attacking players all the way moved up the field. But suddenly what we're starting to see is much less uh, possibility to find space in between the lines. How do you create free, free players in these kinds of conditions? Mm -hmm. And actually what ends up happening is that the, the opposition can quite comfortably keep Man City quiet because um, what you're doing then is you're making it so that the only way they're going to be able to form free men is by moving outside of these compact areas, yeah. right? So you might see this player move out, um, so the centre-back on the ball here, uh, to receive the ball. The free man is now out, outside the block. You're very unlikely to actually, man, a team like Man City are very unlikely to play the ball into these kind of areas because you're under pressure. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you lose the ball here, you're leaving a huge amount of space behind that can be exploited. And so teams like Manchester City and Arsenal, very, very hyper aware of the fact that they can get counted on quite easily. So what we end up ha seeing in this sort of situation is that teams actually don't want to play into pressure. They want to avoid pressure. And so free men end up being you know, outside the block. How do you break down the team? Well, you hope that at some point, you know, one of the defenders makes a mistake, leaves a, does leave a free man between the lines that you can then find and exploit. Mm. Or the other thing that happens, which we see a lot in Manchester City games, is the ball ends up coming around into these wide areas. So you have fullback 1v1. Um, you have these matchups here between a fullback and a, an attacking player. Mm. And then you just hope that you have like the talent advantage here that you're wide player is going to be able to get around, hit the byline and, and, and yeah. get the ball into the box. But in the, many games you would have that, but when you're Man City playing against Arsenal, you might not. No, and, and even in games against Brentford, right? Brentford play this way. They play with a back five because, again, it gives them the, the, the leniency to get players out into wide areas without compromising in the box. Um, and you can you can keep the, you can double up on these players. So, yeah, OK, maybe there's a talent advantage here with Jeremy Doku, but then what about this? Does, do you have that talent advantage anymore? Probably not. And if you've got a back five, you still got the, the four players in the box to defend. So the issue here then is that for, for Manchester City, what they're not wanting to do is play into pressure. And so the free man always ends up outside the block. And so what you end up then is with, with a lot of the, you know, the ball being moved around. They're trying to find these mistakes. But what if the mistake never happens? Maybe it never comes. And then maybe you get hit on the, on the break, which is why Man City will lose, you know, drop points in one every 10 games. Mm. Um, more often than not, they're going to win. But more often than not, the games are going to end up sort of becoming these very sort of patient games where it's about City retaining possession, risk aversion, not wanting to put the ball into areas which are going to cause them problems. And so as a result, they just want to keep possession rather than actually try and score a goal. The other thing that this re reminds me of is um, when Man City are in these positions and they have uh, pegged the team back, in uh, last weekend's case it was Arsenal who defended superbly, when they lose the ball, they do something, don't they, John? They do tactical fouling, which is not exclusively a Manchester Cityism. There are lots of teams that do it. In fact, I think Liverpool did it against Brighton a lot the same day. It's also quite boring, isn't it? Yeah, and it comes back to what we were talking about before, which is what you're trying to do is squeeze the opponent back, find these openings, and, and to do that, you have to be really aggressive in your positioning. As you can see, the way we've got the, the pitch set up here, there's no Man City player apart from the goalkeeper in, in their own half. And so if you do lose the ball, you are quite vulnerable because there is a lot of space to attack. So what will end up happening is that the, the, the Manchester City player would rather take the foul um, than, than risk letting the, the player pass them. So they take the player out. Um, that's why it's called a professional foul. And, and, and you, yeah, you take your yellow card. But what you've done is you've stopped that from becoming a dangerous situation. And yeah, it, it, it stops the exciting situation from happening, right? So mm. people will consider it to be, to be quite boring. Duncan, with your human hat on mm. for a moment, what do you feel about tactical fouling? 
Well, we know it's an issue that people are looking at because in the latest kind of IFAB stuff, you know, the, the idea of the blue card was mooted and I think the, the coloured card was dismissed because people got angry, as they do. <laughs> but I think the idea there for like Simbins, for, for tactical fouls, is an interesting one because I think um, Liam Thalm pointed out that it doesn't necessarily mean that the it will stop it because teams might kind of think that they can kind of basically drop with 10 men for 10 minutes and almost cope with a power play if you like yeah so but again I think it's quite interesting and I think you know the history of football essentially is the history of tweaks to the laws that have had big impacts on the game and we kind of that happens and maybe any two or three years later or seasons later we actually see how it affects the game and I think we're very much in one of those periods at the moment. Mm. I guess the problem with tactical fouling as well is it, it, it very much depends on how the referee referees the game, right? And in these big games, you often, you hear them praised for, for, by comment, commentators for this, where they say, oh, they want to let it play. They yeah. don't want to card anyone too early for fear of making the game boring. I wonder, would it, in, nowadays, would it not make it more fun if a player who is going to commit a lot of tactical fouls did get a yellow card in the first half? It might allow the play a bit more. Yeah, and it goes back to the whole punditocracy ness of it, where, you know, the idea of letting it go, the game go early so that you can get a few fouls in is seen as kind of correct and the right way to, you know, for our league to, to unfurl. And yeah, I think it's kind of gone too far the other way now. And last weekend probably was a good example of both teams doing that and getting away with it. And it's almost like once players realise they can get away with it, that changes the shape of the game because both teams are like, oh, okay, we've got this sort of you know, mini advantage mm. um, when we're defending. The other problem is as well is that the end point of that is taking players off the pitch, as you said, with a blue card and then eventually a red card. And that makes the game more boring as well because the team with a player down are just going to sit deeper as well. So it's, it's almost like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Yeah. You're going you're gonna to end up with a boring game whichever way around it goes. And I suppose this all comes back to this concept of like what's actually most important to the teams here is, is winning rather yeah. than providing entertainment for the fans. Well, for the coaches, it seems about a lot about control as well, Duncan. I mean, was it always like this? Or do, <laughs> do I look back on the past with rose-tinted glasses and think, you know, football used to be fast and fun and now it's, you know, nil-nil in these big games? Well, on those two points, I think football's probably faster than ever. Mm. Um, so that doesn't probably stand up. I think the physicality has always been important in English football. Um, what we've done in the last sort of five, ten years is combine a level of skill with physicality which probably has never been seen anywhere really and, and I guess that's why the Premier League is, is so popular but we've always gone through this historically. I mean, yeah, I remember when the, the pandemic happened and people sort of said, oh, this, these sort of things happen once every hundred years. It kind of feels a bit like that with football. I mean, in 2025, we'll be a hundred years on from the, the change in the offside law from having to have three players back as it used to be up until then to two, which we still have. It's obviously been tweaked a little bit here and there since then, but basically the reason they did that was because in the 1920s football had become boring and they, they actually admitted that it had become boring and the, the authorities were like, we've got to do something about it. Mm. So they made that change and then immediately there was a, an extra goal per game in the following season and it, it led to new tactics, the WM came in and, and I think that's quite interesting because this, you know, the last couple of years, as, as John will know, that we've kind of gone back to that formation a little bit for the first time since the 1960s and we've now this season 3.2-ish goals per game is going to be the highest since the 1960s. So mm. all these things are sort of echoes from the past, really. And, and football but changes all the time, and yet sometimes just goes back to older sort of versions of itself. Mm. You mentioned before as well, like even in the early 2000s, football was considered a lot more defensive. And I think, again, we get that, we get that back and forth between physicality and technicality. I think we're going through a real physicality phase at the moment and we you know we, we talked about I am <laughs> in the aftermath of the, the game at the weekend there was eight centre backs on the field and two players playing defensive midfield who played stints at centre back in their time as well I think what we're going to start seeing is a move back towards the technicality at some point maybe it will be again more physical technicality but I, I think that it's, you get such massive gains from being able to have athletic players on mm. the field to stop other teams from scoring. But once you've got all of those benefits, teams will start thinking, well, how do we, how do we get an edge here? What, well, what's did, the next edge going to be? Did we see that last night with Julian Alvarez starting ahead of uh, uh, Erling Haaland, maybe? Yeah, p perhaps. I mm. think that's probably a slightly different tactical conversation. One which would, I would find really interesting. Well, goodness me. Let's move on very quickly. The might find boring. I mean, it's, you, from a tactical perspective then, if we've talk, talked about the, the history of it and the perspective of it, from a tactical perspective, 
uh, positional play, Guardiola type football. Uh, it's still very dominant. It seems as though it's going to con continue to be so. Is that a problem for the future in terms of relative boredom within these big games? Yeah, well, let's just go back to the tactics board for a moment where I said, you know, positional play is trying to find advantages, free players between the lines. Teams are, a bit, are able to stop that. Part of the reason why this is so boring, I think, is because you know, you're not actually getting any active defending in these sorts of situations. What I mean by that is, yes, okay, what you're doing is you're dropping deep, you're compressing space, you're making sure that there's no free men between the lines. But what this means is that actually these two central midfielders here, they aren't actually doing much other than just making sure they're close to the, the opposition player. Because they know that Man City are never going to play the ball really in, into pressure in this scenario. Um, so all they need to do is just place hold. And it, it, what it means is you end up with these structures just staying really nice nice and tidy. That's part of the reason why I think it's so boring because it's not, it's not only defensive football, but it's passive defensive football. We're not even seeing you know, big, big tackles going in or, or whatever. Um, but what I think that the, the reason for why Pep Guardiola's teams uh, are, are looking so maybe boring at the moment is because they are, as I said, they're, they're not going to play that pressure pass. They're going to play around the pressure. So for here, like the free, the free man is outside the block, the ball goes in. Here, and and this they is because they're worried around. about giving up the ball, right? Yeah, exactly. So for me, the issue here isn't necessarily with positional play so much as with the risk aversion that has been attached to it, which is what, which is what Alex was talking about. Yeah, and risk aversion comes out in different forms, and that's how it's coming out now. But you go back to the 2000s and it, in the Mourinho Benitez era, and it was just as risk averse, but in a much more sort of functional way. But mm. it's, it still led to low scoring, a lot of drawn games between the, the big sides. So not every coach does this. No, and I wanted to talk a little bit about Xabi Alonso as an example of a coach who's using positional ideas, but actually breaking some of the rules that we talked about with respect to the way that Guardiola might play. So mm. just got a, a series of screenshots here just showing a, a phase of play that was actually brought to my attention by Martin Raffel, who was on the TIFO podcast last week, mm. did a really excellent Xabi Alonso masterclass, used this, um, this clip to show what Xabi Alonso is doing in, in possession. I think it's really, really interesting. So what we've got here is Leverkusen in, in the black. They're playing this way down the field. And and what, what we have here is Tep Sober on the ball. He's going to play the ball to Granit Xhaka here, but Granit Xhaka is under pressure. Now, normally, as we, as we said, most a, a sort of more risk-averse positional play coach would say, you've got loads of space in front of you here, Tep Sober. Move into that space, carry the ball with you, maybe drag players around, and then you'll generate a positional advantage. Mm. Instead, what he does is he plays the ball directly to Granit Xhaka, who is, you know, fairly closely marked by two players. Sure. Actually, when the ball comes in... He, he is put under pressure by the striker. You know, you're putting yourself in a scenario where you could lose the ball here. Uh, in the end, the ball gets played to Robert Andrick. It doesn't feel like you've developed any positional advantage here. You've just moved the ball to a, a player that you could easily have just passed to without any pressure whatsoever. So we're already starting to see some of the rules being broken from what, from what you might expect from, from Pep Guardiola. Mm. The play moves on. Andrick passes the ball to Granit Xhaka, who then passes the ball to, and this is Florian Wirtz here. Mm. And again, what we're seeing is passes being made to players under pressure. Uh, and... Passes that don't really seem to have a huge amount of like upside to them again from that point of view of a positional advantage. The ball goes to Florian Wirtz and he plays the ball immediately back out to where it originally was. Um, and so, again, what's happening here is a lot of the rules are being broken, but the difference is, is what I was talking about before with respect to passive and active defending. What we've got here now is five players from the opposition who are actively having to respond to these short passes being made into pressure. Mm. And what you end up with is the, the structure breaking down. Um, and so when the ball comes back out to uh, Kosanu over here, what we see is you've actually developed other kind of advantages just from pulling the opposition structure apart. So Florian Wirtz can run in behind because the, the centre-back has stepped up. Kasuna's in space, you've got 3v3 in this kind of area as well. Mm. So what you're doing then is by, yes, still using positional ideas to get, to get benefits, but by playing these p passes into pressure, what you're doing is destabilising the structure and making it much easier to break down. So, for example, in the Man City-Arsenal game, in those scenarios, Arsenal don't have to do much active defending. They can sit in their block. The players aren't going to get pulled around that much because City aren't going to play the dangerous pass because they don't want to lose the ball. Whereas what's happened here is... Leverkusen use their, their, their technical players and saying, fine, we'll play into pressure, we'll, we'll rate our players to be able to get out of those situations and this will generate mm. advantages that we can, we can actually benefit from. The play does go on a little bit further and what I wanted to show now, this is another interesting aspect of how you actually do get positional advantages from this sort of situation. So Tap Sober gets the ball. the ball, the ball was going this way, they decided to come back round, so similar to what you might see from City. You've got Granit Xhaka here, 
And again, what we see is just a bounce pass between these two players, Tapsoba and Shaka. Shaka is obviously under pressure. He's not, you're not going to get a huge amount of benefit from him unless he can turn, but he's unlikely to do it with those two players so close. So receives the bounce pass. These two players have to respond to him, active defending again. Mm. Uh, but the ball comes back to tap sober. But the, th the benefit you get from that then is that these two players, because they've been actively defending, have been pulled out of space, and tap sober can actually just play the ball now to the free player in between the lines. Right. So what we're seeing here now is that by forcing opponents to actually actively defend, putting yourself at more risk, being less risk averse, you are still able to get positional advantages. And, and we end up with this situation now where Hoffman has the ball, he's in between the lines, this is, you know, you've got options all around, you can play the ball through. They've generated a dangerous moment by actually breaking some of the rules that Pep Guardiola might not allow his players to break. It's like when you, you're distracted by a wasp on your arm and you swap the wasp away, but then you're stung by its friend, the bee, you know? It's, it's, <laughs> is that a common that occurrence? Just not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose the fun thing about this, this conversation is that if uh, Guardiola and Arteta, for example, are being risk averse, it's not necessarily working because there's another team that are potentially more likely to win the league at the moment, managed by a slightly riskier coach, wouldn't you say? The madcap Jurgen Klopp. Yeah, I mean, it's A, nice to have a very rare three-horse title race. Mm. They are rare. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting, yeah, because it's almost like the torts in the hair. Arsenal and City are, are so focused on each other. And then, oh, look, Liverpool have, have gone ahead. And I do think the thing, we, to John's point a minute ago, I think Klopp's a more adaptable manager. He, he does change a bit more. You know, like Liverpool have gone back to more transitions this season, a bit like they did maybe sort of 2017 to 2019-ish. And that's because of the players he has available. And I think he, he's probably more pragmatic and sometimes that doesn't work. Mm. We've seen, you know, I think, I think Klopp's got a bigger sort of win-loss um, potential. You know, we've seen Liverpool and Dortmund both have bad seasons under him. But when it works, it really works. And yeah. it feels like he kind of relies on or uses momentum more than someone like Guardiola or Arteta would. You know, they, they, they're scared of that. They, they can't control that, whereas yeah. he kind of leans into it. It's worth saying that, contrary to popular belief, Jurgen Klopp is playing positional football as well. And that's why I wanted to talk about, you know, risk aversion, because that's, that's the difference between someone like Pep Guardiola and, and Jurgen Klopp. We, should, we could talk about Ange Postacoglu as well. Postacoglu is a positional coach. Um, but uh, what these guys are trying to do is they are playing those riskier passes quicker, moving the ball with more tempo, where Man City will not actually play the more incisive pass. They'll retain possession. You'll see from Tottenham that they will do that. And that's why the Spurs games are sort of so back and forwards and, and you know, they can concede late goals because Postacoglu just doesn't really care about game state, right? If they're, even if they're winning, he's still going to have his team attacking. Yeah, I mean, Spurs have come from behind to take 20 points and let 20 points slip, slip the season, which is, you know, the first time that's happened in the Premier League for a long time, which speaks to that point. And I think, and it goes back to the original thing about boringness, um, in the sense that, you know, Guardiola wins the league most seasons, but they all kind of blend into one, whereas the Klopp one really stands out because Liverpool just, you know, won 20 odd of their first 23 games. and. And it's that kind of like searing yourself into the memory. You know, in 50 years' time, someone will look back and go, oh, look, City won five out of six seasons. They're really good. But, you know, in the time, I think people really latch onto the memories of the exciting teams. And it's creating that kind of that risk that I think really gets into people's heads. Mm. Well, I mean, this conversation all started because of a big game, you know, a game considered to be a, a title challenge, Duncan. Is it even necessary to win those games? I mean, it, there's an argument to make that both teams would be relatively happy with a point uh, and no goals in that game. Do you need to win those big games to win the league? Or do Manchester City, when they win five times out of six, do they, you know, just get through some of them with draws? I mean, when we've seen seasons where, you know, teams have been getting 90, even 100 points once, City obviously did, they just win pretty much every game. I mean, this season, what I think is interesting, if you look at the big six mini table, there's so many draws. You know, City have drawn six out of nine. Uh, Arsenal have drawn four out of seven, haven't lost. Liverpool have drawn five out of eight. So even in, you know, obviously Manchester United and Chelsea are not having great seasons, but they're still big games when they play. Um, there is, I don't. I think we've kind of, the risk averseness has crept up on us and we haven't maybe noticed. And maybe last weekend was the first time everyone went, hang on, mm. these big games are getting very sort of, you know, tense and, and close again. And it hasn't been that way for a while. So, yeah, I think it is different. Mm. And Sposta Cogley came up in conversation already as a, as a type of coach. Does things differently, yeah? Less risk averse. There are more out there, Duncan, aren't there? Who are they? Because I believe The Athletic is uh, currently releasing a mini-series on some of these coaches. Up-and-comers. Well, up-and-comers is a good question because I think the age profile did very little bit. So, you know, to the Postacogli point, 
you know, when do you sort of become an up and coming manager? But yeah, we went through uh, Thiago Motta, Kira McKenna, Paolo Fonseca, mm -hmm. uh, Garcia Pimienta, Will Still, and Michelle. I don't know who that is. Who's Garcia Pimienta? He's the Las Palmas manager. Oh. And Las Palmas are probably, I mean, John will know more, but the craziest team out there. Their goalkeeper basically has as many touches in the centre circle as a League One team will do in a season. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's very much on the the outside of the curve in terms of you know thinking and, and trying new stuff. Oh. Yeah, they're quite fun because what they're doing is they're doing similar stuff to what Man City are doing, but rather than using it as a way of like dominating in the league, they're using it as a way of being able to defend more by just possessing the ball. Right. So they have to do less defending because they are able to possess the ball for longer, which is quite fun. They sound like a team who have probably fouled quite a lot, John. <laughs> yeah. And what a perfect segue we have <laughs> now, because Ruben Pender went out to Wembley to find out the answer to this question. Which team has drawn the most fouls? Most of us have a decent idea of which Premier League players get fouled the most, but what about the most fouled team? I'm outside Wembley to ask fans if they can guess the correct answer. Most fouled, it's got to be Man City, sure then. Not actually. Maybe City then, they're trying to... Not City. No, it's got to be someone like Liverpool. Liverpool? It'd be like a Foden or a, a lighter player that gets knocked I, around. I say City all the time though. Yeah, but... I, I would have gone Liverpool just because they like, again, counter-attacking football, so you, you Salah, your Diaz. Probably Liverpool? Every, everyone's guessing Liverpool to that question. It's not actually correct. Uh, Arsenal, I would guess. Arsenal. Why? Uh, Saka. Very valid. Incorrect. I <laughs> was so confident. I love it. Um, Aston Villa. Villa. Is it Villa? Fast wingers. Yeah. Strong striker. The way that they play, they score a lot of goals as well. So I think they're just prone to fouls. I'm going to say Tottenham. I'm going to say Tottenham. You are spot on. Oh. <laughs> Tottenham Hotspur. Oh, of course it is. Yeah. Okay. Posta Coglu style plays mental. Yeah. It's so fast-paced. It is, in fact, Tottenham Hotspur. Okay, yeah, James Madison, I can see that song as well, yeah. Tottenham Hotspur. Oh, Before Duncan gets a chance to look it up, I've just <laughs> told him I'm going to ask him if he can guess which team has drawn the most fouls in the Premier League. The audience already know, Duncan, but we haven't played you the clip, so the joke's on you. Who do you it think is it is? very much on me. Uh, I'm going to say Aston Villa. It's not. Oh, they're second. They were very close, I believe. But it, actually, I don't know if they are second. I might have just made that up. Who knows? It doesn't matter. But who's first? <laughs> Duncan? One more guess. One more guess. Come on. Um, is he an up and comer? Is he already up? Uh, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Tottenham. It's Tottenham. Right. I was going to say Tottenham. By quite a, quite a, some distance as well. Mm. You know, at least enough distance for us to be confident that they still will be when we release this episode. <laughs> but thank you, uh, Ruben. And Ruben will be back next week, also at Wembley. Uh, because he filmed them all at the same time, and we'll work out how to uh, how to squeeze that one in as well. I suppose as we round out now, Duncan, I'm I'm, I'm curious to ask you, you know, I won't just say what's football for because that that's quite a big that's quite a big subject. Yeah. But as it relates to this Arsenal Manchester City game, which started this conversation for us, the one caveat I think that we need to address is I doubt it was boring for Arsenal and Man City fans, right? It, it might not have been fun, but it was certainly tense and it would have been compelling and, and engrossing. It was boring for neutrals. Does that matter? Not really, I wouldn't say. I mean, I think the Premier League has grown throughout its existence and had various periods of being interesting and boring. I think the, the tension within it, I think, I think I'd say, I'm gonna pluck a number out of the air here, I'd say 41% of neutrals still found that an enthralling <laughs> game. Mm. Um, and you're right about if it's your team playing, you don't notice, I mean, I've, I've watched some team, some games involving the team I support that have been apparently awful, but I've been completely engrossed. So, <laughs> you know, and football is very much in the eye of the beholder. You know, it's um, that game. May, if we don't know how the season's going to end, if it ends, you know, ma imagine City, Liverpool win the, the by a point or a goal difference or something. You know, that game will then take on such significance because yeah. it's like, oh well, if one of those teams had just attacked a bit more or you know been a bit more risky then they could have won the league. You, a lot of football, you don't really kind of grasp until you look back at it. And um, That's a good point. In fact, I listened to my friend John McKenzie on the Second Captains podcast with uh, Jonathan Wilson earlier this week. And I thought Jonathan Wilson described this game well as a game that's maybe more interesting to talk about afterwards than it was to watch. Yeah, and it's worth distinguishing, I think, between what is interesting about that game. Because as I've, I've spent the whole of this, this uh, recording talking about positional play and trying to find positional advantages. That's going on in this game. So if you if you understand that that's the, the sort of tactical level that is being played out, you watch that game, you can see the way that Man City are trying to find these advantages and you can see the way that Arsenal are trying to stop them. That's interesting. It might not be engrossing or 
or, or entertaining for, for, for most people, but it is going on there. You can, you can watch those things. And that's why people will describe these kind of games as intriguing tactical battles. Mm. Um, but I think the, the, the interesting thing for me is that what we've got in football is essentially an, an, an industry that people are desperate to try and make into an entertainment industry. But at the end of the day, it's, it's clubs that are owned by people who have a lot of money who are trying to use those clubs as vehicles for either making more money or you know, enhancing their status or whatever. Mm. They don't necessarily care about whether or not the fans are, are entertained, beyond the fact that you know, if every game was boring, then people would stop watching. But we're talking about one game here in a season of, what, 380 games yeah. that people have, have latched onto. And, and I think that's the kind of interesting question here, is, is, it, is that, yeah, this game, it wasn't boring, there was interesting things about it. It wasn't entertaining, but it was one game in 380 games and everyone was tuning in anyway, right? It's the, yeah. the, 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 uh, the solution to, if you don't like that kind of game, is don't watch that kind of game, but people will still watch it. So, yeah, yeah I think there's a, there's a lot going on, but, you know, most of the time football is entertaining. The, the game before was Liverpool versus Brighton, which was really thrilling. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's, you know, it's a horses for courses thing, right? I mean, I think the key uh, philosophical question here is, can something be both interesting and boring at the same time? And, John, when I look at you, <laughs> I know that's to be true. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including David Ornstein, Amy Lawrence and Rafa Honigstein. With the latest transfer news and insight on every Premier League story that matters, TheAthletic.com puts you inside football and you can try it free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.